Lovely. Well, it's, it's nice to be been invited here. Uh, thank you to Andrew for inviting me. Uh, it's nice to meet some of you uh, this morning as well. Um, so I'm Ben Grist, and I have been at Southampton for the last few years studying mathematics. And uh, since graduating uh, this summer, I'm now based over near Wimborne at a church over there. Um, but I absolutely love the Bible. I'm really passionate about it, and I want to be able to share it with, with everyone I meet. But at Christmas time nowadays, most people celebrate the um, arrival of uh, a man. Uh, some believe that he's real, some don't believe that he's real. He's an all-knowing man who comes to judge you on whether you've done good things or bad things and decide whether or not you deserve this free gift. In, in people's minds, they know that their qualification for uh, this free gift is based solely on their merits. But actually, when you think about it, you realise that it's impossible to actually live up to these merits. Who's, who's his name? It's Father Christmas. We also learn about someone else, uh, someone a lot more real and alive, and that's Jesus Christ. And he's the real meaning of why we celebrate Christmas. It's the second week of Advent now, and I'm sure most of you are yeah, ready um, and excited about Christmas. Maybe, maybe not, I don't know. But either way, I'm sure you know what the real meaning of Christmas is. I don't need to go on to that. I thought the first passage that we had up there, Isaiah 9, is absolutely an amazing verse and prophecy uh, for, for what is to come. But we're, yeah, we're going to talk about that in, in the next few weeks anyway. So I'm, today I would like to speak about uh, Mark. So if you've got your Bibles, then it would be great to uh, look at Mark chapter 1 with me together. Mark is speaking to the Gentiles, trying to get across to them the message of Jesus he had, yeah, I think he had his work cut out for him uh, when trying to explain them um, why Jesus was so important um, and why that affected them. But actually, he starts in a great way here, um, just saying about how uh, this is such good news about the Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. He refers to him as the Messiah. In Greek, we might call him Christ. In English, we might call him the Anointed One. He then quotes from Isaiah. Um, he reads... I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. Does anyone know where this is in Isaiah? Probably not because it's not actually in Isaiah. This is actually in Malachi. Uh, the Isaiah bit comes later on. Uh, this is in Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. So I'll just read that, um, the, the whole of, of that verse that he's quoting from. Um, Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple the messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come says the Lord Almighty now we know that Malachi was writing to the people who were feeling uh, who were who were feeling abandoned very much they had broken their promises and their covenant concerning divorce and sacrifices and lots of other things as well um, but they were feeling abandoned they hadn't heard from God in a long, in a long, long time um, and at the start of this verse, God is answering through Malachi, saying that he is coming to show himself, the God of judgment and justice. Are they ready to meet him and bear this sentence? Malachi was reminding them to be ready for the Messiah, as they were not living uh, the way that God had wanted. What I find remarkable is that Malachi's name actually means my messenger. And here we see some of the wordplay with his name. Uh, I think there's no doubt that because of his name, he actually specifically chose to use this word messenger uh, when he's writing this prophecy. And this is the same messenger that's referred to in his Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, um, and is a good 400 years before, at least, before Jesus uh, comes. So it's going to be foretelling the coming of the Messiah and his messenger. So uh, the second part of this quotation um, in Mark chapter 1, verse 3, we're given the quotation from Isaiah now. So it's in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. We read Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. The first part of that says, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has re received from the Lord's hand Double for all our sins. A voice of one calling in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord and make straight in the desert a highway for our God. 
Now here, the translation supposes that in the wilderness is the place where we should be preparing the way for uh, the Lord. Interestingly enough, um, uh, we, if we would, were to suppose this, um, that we were referring to the, the way being prepared in the desert, then we might think of this, this wilderness uh, actually signifying the Jewish culture uh, to which John was sent to, to announce uh, this coming Messiah. In many ways, uh, you could have seen this um, as being thought of like a desert, destitute and un unfruitful. However, depending on which translation you use, the, uh, the Septuagint uh, punctuates the sentence as a voice crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. So actually, you, you could interpret it either way. Um, I think there's a bit of, um, it's hard to tell which is exactly right, but either way you think about it, it's definitely referring to here as John the Baptist, and I reckon that he perfectly fulfills this prophecy um, shown, which we could, for example, we could talk about from John chapter 1, verse 22 to 23, which says, Finally, they, the Pharisees, said, Who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. Who do you say about yourself? Speaking to John the Baptist. John replies in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of of the one calling in the wilderness, make straight the way for the Lord. What fascinates me about this prophecy is that where the voice says, prepare the way for the Lord. Straight away, we're reminded to prepare the way for the Lord um, in this, in this uh, quotation, in this prophecy. Now, uh, I love the picture that we started with at the start. I hadn't seen this beforehand, um, but I was reminded that over the, sunny, sun, uh, over the summer, I was able to take, well, I was able to go with my father, who we brought here today, Perry. Um, both of us went on a, a pilgrimage. We went on a, a walk around the, the north of Spain. We, we went along the, the Camino de Santiago, and it was a very long way. Uh, we, we walked about 400 kilometers of it. Um, but uh, all along the way, we were walking on different tracks. Some of it was, was lovely uh, tarmac road. Other parts of it was rocks. Some, some parts of it you could barely get through because it was muddy and really, really like jaggedy rocks. And um, a lot of the time I was just spent time um, talking with him or talking with other people and spending a lot of time talking with God as well. We said that uh, throughout this, this pilgrimage, throughout this walk, there are three parts to it. There is the, the physical um, aspect of things. The first few days or weeks, you spend the time just trying to get through, get through the days because it's really, really tough. It's phys physically demanding. The second uh, third of the, of the walk is more mentally demanding. But then actually, when you get to the last third, all of those things, you've got through all your thoughts, you've got through all your um, physical barriers, and now you're just left um, in, this, uh, in this passage uh, with God. And uh, yeah, I had so many visions and uh, stories to tell from it, um, but we can't go into that now. Um, but it was an amazing time uh, for me for that. What reminded me of this was that actually um, today we're going to be thinking about preparing the way for the Lord. And actually the way, well, the way in, in Spanish is the Camino. And actually we were walking this way and uh, to see the different types of dirt tracks that you come along, along the way, you can see how actually um, it would have made a lot more sense for them to be preparing the way, for example, in that situation. In Eastern practice, it was very common uh, transition to repair the roads along the path for royalty if they travel down there. In the same way, this passage um, in Isaiah chapter 40 shows us, well, physically here at least, that we should be flattening the path and repairing the roads for Jesus' arrival. Imagine the, a whole town coming out um, uh, here in Windsor. Imagine them all coming out to, to create a new track just for, just for the queen to come down or something, and then getting rid of all the grass and all the rocks and everything. But, I mean, nowadays we might have just put down tarmac or something to make it easier, and we've got a steamroller to flatten the ground. So maybe it's a bit easier nowadays. But actually, uh, this, this image stems a lot more further than just the physical. It's uh, more metaphorical, and this would, this would involve strictly clearing the road of any obstacles that might come its way. Um, along the path for this royal procession. In the next part of Isaiah chapter 40, uh, so yeah, we get, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough grounds shall become level, the rugged places 
a plague. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together. For the mouth of God, of the Lord, has spoken. For me, this is such an incredible biblical image of this highway to salvation that I was talking about. This could be taken physically, but actually um, there's other times that it's also represented um, more spiritually in terms of the removal of spiritual obstacles as well. Just like in Isaiah chapter 57, verse 17, and it will be said, build up, build up, prepare the road. Remove the obstacles out of the way for my people, of my people. Yeah, so to, I mentioned earlier that today we're thinking about preparing the way for the Lord, making straight this path in preparation for his coming. Though for most of us at Christmas time, preparation for his arrival may be a case of putting up a Christmas tree or maybe putting up a few decorations, maybe counting down the days on an advent calendar or something. Um, we've got lots of chocolates at home now, um, which is lovely, but all of us are on a diet, so we've, we're not meant to be having them. But what does it actually mean to be preparing the way for the Lord? How do we prepare the way for the coming of Christ? Well, back to Mark. In Mark chapter 1, verses 4 to 8, we can go on to see how John the Baptist is calling out how we can prepare the way. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. What, what astounds me about this passage is the next uh, verse or so where it says, The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins, and they were baptised by him in the Jordan River. Christmas is an incredible opportunity to be reminded and to remind others of this good news, that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came to earth as a baby, Humbling himself, he lived and suffered all the pain and temptation that we could feel. As a human, yet sinless being, and then paid the ultimate price, dying as a sacrifice for our wrongdoings, our sins. Jesus has made a way for us to know the Father directly and receive eternal life from him. Isn't that a reason to be joyous? I mean, isn't that alone a reason to be celebrate, celebrating Christmas? In preparation for his arrival, we should seek forgiveness from him and allow ourselves to be washed white as snow in the presence of our saviour. So first off, John the Baptist said, repent. Hmm. Next, to prepare for the coming of Christ, we should be preparing ourselves. We talked briefly about this first point um, about repentance, but actually we are really um, anticipating his arrival or are we just waiting for it to pass? Are we really looking forward to this Christmas time? Or are we just saying, oh, it's another Christmas time. You know, I'll, I'll see how quickly I can get past it without getting involved too much um, or anything like that. I don't, I don't know which one you are. But all of these prophecies were encouraging the people over thousands and thousands of years that one day this anointed would, one would come. I don't think that we could even imagine what the world would be like without Jesus. And actually, these people over thousands of years, these people over thousands of years have been into anticipating this arrival of Jesus. And now, a lot, it turns out to me that a lot of Christians nowadays don't even like to think about it or celebrate it. And actually, this is, this is the, the fundamental part of our faith, that Jesus has come and he has died for us. Christmas tends to start off invited or uninvited before it comes a delight. Do we truly appreciate or believe how important and amazing um, it is that Jesus came to earth. Like this was a history defining moment. Christmas won't have its intended effect until we feel desperately the need for a savior. I think a bit like we were talking about earlier in the intercessions, that actually um, God could do this all without us. Um, and in the same way, the church here today would be boring if God wasn't actually here. If Jesus wasn't here, then what, what are we doing here? Actually, um, we, we, we really need to appreciate the need for this Saviour. We really need to appreciate the need for Jesus to be able to um, come together and really um, appreciate why, why we're here and why, you know, why, why we believe what we believe. In some ways, I think Advent to Christmas um, is, is very much what Lent is to Easter, this time of self-reflection, 
um, and a chance to, to really examine ourselves and prepare ourselves uh, for what is to come. I'm sure you all know Psalm 139, um, but not, halfway through it says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. I absolutely love it as well. But secondly, I want us to yeah, think about preparing ourselves. Finally, as we look ahead in, in chapter, Mark, chapter 1 in Mark's Gospel, uh, at verses 14 and 15, after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. In the same way, we should be doing what Jesus did. What would Jesus do? Well, he said this, so we should be doing the same. We should be proclaiming the message to others, just as Jesus did as soon as he started his ministry. Just as we saw in Isaiah that we were reading earlier, we need to be preparing this road for the arrival of the king, making straight the path. This means sharing the good news with everyone and making the journey easy for Jesus as he enters. Build God-centred anticipation for expectancy and excitement into your home. If any of you have children, um, then get them excited too. If you're excited, then they're going to get excited. If you can only make Christmas exciting with material things, how will the Christians, uh, how, will, how will the children get that thirst for God if they're just looking forward to the material things? Be much in your word and understanding um, of the word and memorise these great passages, that, that I, some of them that I've mentioned today. Uh, another one is, is not my word like fire, said the Lord. Well, gather around that fire this Advent season. It's warm, it's sparkling with colours of grace, it's healing for a thousand hertz, it's light for dark nights. So thirdly, why don't we proclaim this good news to others? I absolutely love um, what I've been hearing about this church from this morning. It seems like you're very mission-focused and that you do have a real heart for the community and inviting people, um, non-Christians, along as well, um, which I think is incredible. But if you don't, uh, then I'd really like to encourage you to, to have a go um, at yeah, sharing this good news with others. And um, if, well, if you do, then why don't you get others along as well? You're right if you're thinking to yourself, well, this is all well and good for preparing our, ourselves and preparing things for this remembrance of Jesus' birth every year. But that's already happened. That's in the past now. You're right. Jesus is with us all the time now. And we should be prepared and growing in a relationship with him all the time. Not just during Advent or Christmas or Lent <coughs> or Easter. We've talked about Jesus' first coming. But actually, what about Jesus' second coming? I'm sure a lot of you might uh, remember Matthew 24. I'm just going to read a short extract from that as well. Uh, Matthew chapter 4, verses 36 to 42. No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be the com at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage up to the day of Noah entered the ark. And they were oblivious until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken, the other left. Therefore keep watch, because you do not know the day on which your Lord will come. So because of this, we should be prepared all the time, not just coming up to Christmas time. So maybe this Advent, you could be reminded about being ready for the Messiah. We remember his birth at Christmas time, but it's so much more than this. We should be preparing for the, the way for the Lord all the time. In our everyday lives, we should be speaking to, seeking to prepare ourselves and prepare others for his arrival through sharing the good news and reminding them of what this Christmas time is really all about. So how do we do this? Repent. Seek forgiveness in our lives. If you don't yet, yet know the love of God, if you, don't, if you have friends who don't yet know him, then why don't you encourage them um, and keep on encouraging them 
Don't just let, let them uh, fall, fall behind or forget about them, but actually keep on sharing, sharing this message. And for yourselves as well, keep on remembering that Jesus brings this forgiveness, this free gift of grace. Secondly, prepare ourselves and our hearts. Allow God to fill us up with his Holy Spirit, that we may feel a unique sense of joy and anticipation for the coming of the Messiah all the time, but especially at Christmas time. And thirdly, proclaim the good news to others. It's the gospel message. I think you guys, it sounds like you guys are doing a good, great job of it here, but as well, be, be really trying to get, make sure that we get all those flyers out to every single person. Let no one person in this area actually go, go, go um, without hearing about the good news of Christmas time, about the good news of Jesus coming uh, this Christmas. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you that you love us so much, that you sent your son to earth to pay the price for our sins. Thank you that your word stands true and that throughout the year, and especially at Christmas time, we can always celebrate, anticipate, especially at Christmas time, the coming of your son, both when, we, when he came as a baby and one day when he shall come again. Father, please forgive us for not eagerly awaiting his coming and not appreciating how important this gift you have already given us really is. Father God, help us to make straight the way for you now as we seek your guidance in our lives continually. Fill us up with your Holy Spirit that we might be able to share your good news with every nation. Help us to prepare the way for you and at this Christmas time, that we would stay focused on you and remember why it is important to us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.